Hey, it's Joe Solari and welcome to the Business of Writing. Today we have a special guest all the way from Madrid, Spain, Ricardo Fayette. How are you doing, Ricardo? Hey, Joe. Thanks for having me. I'm pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> so for those folks that don't know um, who you are, why don't you talk a little bit about um, you know, your company and what you do and kind of your place in the author community? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so I started Read C in 2014, uh, along with three other co-founders. Um, and I mean, what Read C was in 2014 is really mostly the core of our business till today. It's a uh, it's a marketplace to help authors connect with uh, real, really good editors, uh, cover designers, book marketers, ghostwriters, pretty much anyone an author would ever need to hire throughout their their journey throughout their career. Um, obviously we've added a lot of things to that since we've got free courses, we've got a free formatting tool. Uh, so a bunch of things we can talk about. Um, but that's really still the core, the core of our, our business, the, the marketplace. And, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, you can find me at most conferences whenever those are happening again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you gotta my... freed up your schedule quite a bit this year. Yeah, definitely. I didn't expect to spend so much time at home, but mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and what got you into this business? I mean, it's not like this is something that everybody thinks about as far as doing a startup in. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually my co-founder, Emmanuel, our CEO, who, who had this idea. I think he studied in, spent a semester in Canada and self-publishing was just starting in the US and Canada and it sounded pretty interesting to him. So we discussed it and the obvious question to us was like, if someone's self-publishing, who's, mm -hmm. um, who's doing the editing, who's doing the design, who's helping market the book, like all that, all these are tasks that are done by people in house and traditional publishing companies or were uh, done in house. Um, so, so yeah, that's how we came up with the idea for a marketplace. Mm. And o over, um, over time, you know, like you said, you started in 2014. So that, that in the book industry, that's like decades, right? Um, how have you seen things change as far as, you know, people coming onto your platform on both sides of the marketplace, that being, you know, authors using it as well as um, the resources, the people that I guess used to be in the traditional publishing space now having to come into independent contracting. Yeah, there's been, there's been really huge growth on both sides. Um, I think everyone's aware of the growth in self-publishing, like a lot of, um, a lot of aspiring authors just bypassing the whole traditional publishing process and publishing their books themselves. A lot of traditionally published authors getting the rights back to their backlist and self-publishing. So we're, we're all aware of the growth there. Um, what's really interesting is that there's a very, very similar growth on the other side uh, on kind of freelancers providing services to, to in the authors. Mm -hmm. A lot of those have come just out of the blue. Some people with some design skills who decided one day that they'd, they'd be cover designers for like their author friends. Uh, but there's also a lot, a lot of people who were traditionally employed by publishing houses who have been either let go or have decided to go freelance. Um, most of them as freelance contractors still provide their services to the same traditional publishing companies. Um, it's just the freelance economy has reached the, the world of traditional publishing, mm. but they're also available to offer the services to in the authors. Um, so our marketplace was able to kind of bridge those two, those two trends. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I expect to see even more, even more freelancers uh, and high quality freelancers joining Reed in the next few months. Um, yeah, because, because of the, the economical downturn. Yeah. Why don't, talk about that for a second with how you've seen the shocks of COVID impact, you know, the marketplace, you know, services being used or not being used, more, more people coming into the market, whatever it might be to help anybody watch and kind of get a insight into the marketplace. Yeah, it's been really interesting actually. And, and yeah, we've reached, um, like we reached a market size where we can see changes happening pretty quickly and pretty evidently. Um, we actually found out we're a pretty seasonable, season, seasonal business. 
So mm. in the summer, usually we have less activity on the marketplace. Uh, in December, uh, also we, we have a lot less activity on the marketplace because people go to the families around Christmas, um, New Year, all that. Uh, we also see like dips around Thanksgiving and a usual dip was around Easter. So usually in a normal year, we would have like um, really good growth in March and then a small dip in April because of, uh, because of Easter. Mm. And this year, um, when the COVID thing started happening in mid-March, we saw a pretty big dip uh, while the, the month had been going really well. So uh, until then, uh, which is, I think, attributable to the fact that most people we're just focusing on like the COVID thing, uh, mm -hmm. watching the news around it um, and kind of paralyzed by it. And opposed to that, April's been really, really crazy uh, this year for us. Uh, huge growth, uh, record breaking across the board. Um, we've, got, we've got a free short story contest we run every week, more for aspiring authors. And that's been absolutely crazy. We received something like 800 submissions every week um, hmm. so yeah uh, obviously a huge growth in the number of people taking our online courses so i think the yeah the covid situations just pushed a lot of people to kind of double down on their writing um, a lot of aspiring authors are taking the aspiring part more seriously and trying to really make 2020 the year they they get their books done and the only thing is we've seen a small dip in the, the average size of a transaction on Reedsy. So people are spending, when they hire freelancers, they, they tend to spend a little bit less. But I mean, mm. that's not that significant so far. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I had a, a couple questions that you brought up there, but just so we don't lose it. Um, tell me about this short story contest. What, like, what happens with those short stories? And if someone does participate in that, what's... What's the whole idea? Yeah, the whole idea is to, to kind of push people to write, um, especially more and more newbie writers. Uh, the idea is we send out five prompts every week and we host them on the website, actually, five writing prompts. And you've got until the following Friday to, to send a short story about any one of those five prompts. Oh, cool. So short stories between 1,000 and 3,000 words. Um, all the stories, uh, you actually submit them on, on the website, so they become visible a week after, uh, once they've been kind of moderated and approved. People can like them, comment them, um, and we pick a short list of five, I think, and a winner every week, and the winner gets $50. So not a huge cash prize, but it, but as I said, yeah, we've had like 800 submissions in the past few weeks, uh, so people are really, hmm. really having fun with it, and we're seeing a lot of engagement in likes and comments as well. So it's more, it's more the community end of things. Sure. Well, you know, um, one of the things with uh, any economic downturn like we're, we're experiencing is there's going to be businesses that get wiped out and there's going to be new businesses that start up. And my research has shown that um, it, it doesn't really matter economic downturns and upturns, that the number of businesses kind of going in and out of business stays fairly constant. You know, uh, yeah. So I think for some folks, if you've just found out you've lost your job, right, and you're um, in a position where maybe there's some subsidies coming either through unemployment or severance or whatever it may be, this actually could be the time where you could really get that career going, right? Um, Absolutely. Um, so if, if you were somebody like that, um, how can they use uh, Readsy to build their team, right? Because you, you've got all these resources from traditional publishing. Traditional publishing needed those people to get books out the door. Maybe you could walk through the different types of resources and why authors need them and how they could go about sourcing them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, that's a question we have to answer we have to answer pretty, uh, pretty often because most people who come to, who've written the book, they don't really know what's involved in the traditional publishing process. Um, and, and it's actually a good starting point to understand how it, it used to work and still works within traditional publishing houses. Generally, um, 
when when a publisher decides to acquire the rights to a manuscript um, from an author, they they then appoint a developmental editor. So the developmental editor is going to read the book and look at like big picture elements. So if we're talking fiction, it's going to be characterization, plot, uh, dialogue, story structure, uh, the character arcs. Um, all these things and provide a first round of edits to the author, focusing on these on these big picture elements. If it's nonfiction, it's going to be more like structure, how the points are getting across, transitions from one section to another, etc. Um, then the author would rewrite some parts of the manuscript based on on those developmental edits. Uh, and once the the author and the developmental editor are both happy with what the manuscript looks like. Uh, it's then going to get sent to a copy editor. So the copy editor is going to be a separate person and they're going to look at grammar, punctuation, um, typos, formatting, all, all these kind of things. So get the manuscript basically publishing ready. Um, then within traditional publishing, generally the book would go to, um, to a formatter or a typesetter. So someone who's going to prepare the files for ebook and print distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, and these files would then be proofread by uh, by a proofreader. So kind of a last final check. Proofreader would find some things to correct. The file would go back to the typesetter. Typesetter would make changes and then the book would go to print and ebook distribution. Um, and in parallel to all that, uh, a cover designer would be a cover design would be realized by a cover designer. In in soft publishing, it's fairly, I mean it makes sense to kind of respect those steps, especially if this is your first book. Uh, what I generally say is you want at least two different editors to look at your book. One to look at the big picture elements, so one developmental editor, and then at least uh, one copy editor and proofreader. It can be the same person who's going to do both the copy edit and the proofread. And the only difference when you're self-publishing is you can do the proofread straight after the copy edit uh, and before you format the file because traditional publishing companies, the formatting typesetting process is a bit more complicated. It's done by a person. So a lot of mistakes can be introduced at that stage, which is why you want a proofreader uh, to check for those mistakes after the, the typesetting. In self-publishing, most people use automated tools um, like Vellum or Read Book Editor or templates. Um, so mistakes aren't introduced by those tools. So you can do the proofread before the typesetting. So yeah, the steps and people you should hire are developmental editor first, uh, then a copy editor, uh, and then either a proofreader or have that same copy editor do a, a last round of proofreading. In parallel to that, a, uh, a cover designer to design the cover. And then either you have that same designer design the interior for you and do the typesetting, or you use a free tool, uh, which mm -hmm. I generally recommend for 99% for of books. Um, so those are the people you really need to publish the book, get the book out of the door. And then it it all, it's all down to the marketing, uh, obviously, of the book. You can potentially hire people to help you with that, but my main recommendation is to do a lot of research on your own and build your own marketing plan because no one's ever going to do the marketing for you. You can find people to help with specific aspects, but in the long term, you'll have to kind of master and control your own marketing. Mm. Yeah, I think that's um, one of the things in being independent publisher, you, you, you're not you have to do all of those things. And even if you are gonna uh, outsource them, you need to know what good looks like so that you get good results, right? You can't just trust somebody and, um, you know, any, anybody that's managed people understands that you certainly wanna give people the latitude to do their job, but you have to kind of give them guidance on what your expectations are and know what a good result is so you can make that clear to them that that's what you want. Um, Absolutely, yeah. I think the uh, most. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think the most successful people we see on reads are people who who already know everything I just said, who've done their research on the publishing process. Um, and so when they go to a cover designer, for example, they tell the designer exactly kind of what they want on their cover. You know, if if they've written a space opera, they'll be able to tell the cover designer, hey, I want a spaceship on the cover. I want something that looks like an alien planet and I want kind of these types of fonts, you know, I want like all caps, uh, sans serif font because that's what most best selling uh, space opera covers look like. Um, if you don't know all that, you're, 
and you use Reese, you're probably going to end up hiring people who will know that. But uh, but if especially if you're not hiring through Reese, or if you end up with someone who's maybe a really great professional but doesn't know your genre well, then they might not know all that for you. So as I said, do do your research beforehand, uh, and the more you know, the better equipped you'll be to hire the right people. Mm. So I know this because I've had this this experience, and I know a lot of authors have had this experience that when you go. Um, you hear the advice you just gave and you're like, wow, that's, that's what I want to do. And then you go and you see what good editors cost. Um, can you talk through for the people like why that is a, a, a reasonable investment, like the payoffs that come from hiring a good editor, um, you know, short term and long term? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a, a sizable investment. Um, I think you got to like you got to understand what each step of the process brings you. Uh, a lot of authors kind of bulk at the prices for developmental editing, um, and that makes that makes sense because it's generally it's the most expensive type of editing for sure. Um, but I also think it's the most valuable one, especially for people who are writing their first book. Uh, for me, someone who is writing their first book and doesn't hire a developmental editor is making the biggest mistake they can make. Uh, when it comes to the publication of their book because they're not only just gonna make the manuscript better they're gonna teach you things about writing mm. uh, through working on your manuscript that you would maybe not learn even if you took all the writing classes in the world uh, they're gonna teach you things about point of view about characterization about story structure about dialogue uh, about all these all these things but apply to your book like with one example, uh, that is your book, and they're going to work hand in hand with you. So it's what I hear from every author who works with a developmental editor is that it's a huge learning experience for them. And it doesn't just make that first book better. It makes any future book uh, immediately um, a lot better. Obviously, if it's the, the, tenth, the tenth book you write in your space opera series and the plot usually follows the same elements and the world is the same and all that, maybe you don't need a developmental editor at this point. Uh, you've got things pretty well figured out. Uh, but at this point, you'll definitely want a copywriter and a proofreader if you can, if mm. you can still afford them uh, because you want to make your books really professional and you don't want them to have any typos um, that, that could deter from the reading experience. So, so yeah, editing editing's expensive, but you also have to think from the editor's perspective. Like they're reading the book several times. They're annotating. That's hours and hours and hours of work, often by people who've become really, really pros at that, who've been veteran editors for a lot of years. Um, so yeah, it's, it makes sense that it's expensive yeah. and it's worth it. Well, and if you're just getting started and you're, you know, you're new to the game and your copy isn't real clean and it's harder for a, an editor to kind of get familiar with your work. But the thing that really um, hit me with what you said there was when you think about this investment is not just the process of specifically editing this book, but it's almost like you're hiring a coach, right? Absolutely. And, and you think about the money that gets spent on courses and um, all the stuff out there for writing the bestseller. If you pull, if you kind of think about rather than spending that on a, on a course that you're going to self teach, to actually learn kind of on the job, um, that makes that, for lack of a better term, easier to rationalize the investment, yeah. right? And I know for, uh, um, you know, some of the authors that I've been working with is that um, even if they haven't started out with a developmental editor, if they get to a spot where they have hired one, um, to get them through a block or just some issues. After that, they don't tend to get rid of them. Like they keep that person, even if it's not a full developmental edit, they're using them almost kind of, like I said, like a writing coach where it's like, Hey, give me some feedback on this and what's not working. And um, it, it just, you know, it helps you to, to become a better writer. Right. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anybody, anybody that's in sports that is really dedicated to getting better at their game hires 
coaches for different parts of their game, right? So if they're, you know, a professional golfer, they're going to hire a swing coach or they're going to hire a putting coach, work on the areas where they're weaker. Absolutely. We we actually considered uh, adding riding coaches to reach at some point. But when we really looked into it, we realized that they were all developmental editors at the end of the day. Like there's Mm -hmm. a very, very fine line. There's just some who have been clever at marketing themselves as like writing coaches or book coaches or book shepherds. Mm -hmm. Uh, But at the end of the day, it's just developmental editors uh, who intervene maybe at an earlier stage. I know some developmental editors don't want to look at the first draft, um, let alone like a first chapter or an outline. Um, some others are going to be fine with that. Uh, and we have several developmental editors on Reedsy who like consult on outlines or even first chapters. So yeah, they're, they're varying, obviously varying levels of developmental editing, but it's, it's, it's all that for me. Hmm. So when you, when you look at, um, kind of the revenue that comes in the door at, um, Reedsy in those different, um, segments of, uh, services, how would you kind of break it down? Like how much is goes to editing, how much goes to cover design, how much goes to virtual assistance? And then what other categories haven't we touched on that you think authors should think about? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so we've got ghostwriting and read see that's, that's a bit of a special one. So I'm going to put it aside because it's obviously really, really big contracts, but they're not necessarily, they're generally not for authors, not for people who write their own books. Um, mm-hmm. So we're going to put those aside. Uh, so those aside, most uh, 70% are uh, collaborations are for editing, uh, 70 to 75%. So it's definitely the bulk of our business. And I think it's also because the message that you really, really need an editor has really sunk in. And also there are lots of different editors. Like, as I said, there's developmental editing, copy editing, proofreading. So usually people are going to hire at least one of those three mm-hmm. before they publish a book. Um, well, let, let me just cover- interject kind of on that, you know, I think that like you can tell a good cover designer because you can look at their work. Editing's kind of hard. So maybe also weave in there like your process for vetting these editors, because I think that's another part of your secret sauce that you guys are doing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, So cover design is 25, 20%, 20, 25%. Um, and it's, as you said, because a lot of people hire cover designers outside Reedsy, um, because you can judge the, the, the value of the quality of a cover designer easier. Uh, so the way we've had editors is the same way we've had any kind of professional on Reedsy. We have all people who want to apply to offer services on Reedsy. We have them create a profile, um, a Reedsy profile where they have to put in, um, their work experience. And their, and their portfolio. So all the books that they've worked on, on top of like a few lines of like overview, uh, any awards that they've won, things like that. But the, the two things we're going to look at are the portfolio and the, and the work experience. For editors, we almost only accept people who've got a background with traditional publishing, uh, usually when, within one of the big five. And if not, if they've only worked on indie titles, we want to see some big names in there, um, some some books that have sold really, really well in their portfolio. For cover design, it's a little bit more different because there are some like art directors from the biggest publishers who are really, really bad at design, surprisingly bad at design, <laughs> <laughs> because they, they just do art direction, you know, they've never really designed mm-hmm. the cover themselves and we're done the, the elements of the design. So we actually reject a lot of profiles on traditional publishing while we accept a lot of um, indie, indie people or people who are just starting out in cover design. Um, and, and yeah, for marketing, uh, marketing is a small section. So, so we have publicists and marketers on Reality. Uh, we're thinking about removing publicists soon because they only make sense for a very, very tiny subset of authors, people who've written a nonfiction book and have a really, really sellable story that's going to appeal to media. Mm. Um, so we feel like a lot of people who are investing in publicity services on Reedsy are not really getting what they should get for the prices they're putting in. Um, and also because traditional media don't really sell that many books anymore. Mm. Uh, so, so we might remove those soon. Uh, in any case, we've got marketers. So marketers are people 
who offer kind of consultancy services. So kind of book coaches, but on the marketing side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so help you draft up a marketing plan for your release, or we've got people who specialize in ads. So setting up Facebook or Amazon or Pump of ads for authors. We've got some marketers specializing on mailing lists. So setting up a mailing list, connecting it to book funnel, creating the first automation, et cetera. Mm, yeah. Um, people like that on the marketing side. So that's maybe 5% um, of what we see in terms of collaborations on Reedsy. And then we've got author website design, which is the, the smallest, one um but definitely something that we maybe don't talk enough about uh we've got we've got all the website designers on readsy that are really good and the last one we released uh the last segment is translation so that's extremely small for now but we're already mm -hmm. seeing some really cool projects of books translated into german spanish french italian um, and again translators are all on readsy they're all coming from traditional publishing companies within uh their their own countries so obviously not cheap but definitely kind of the best translators you can find out there no that's that's really interesting i i know that um again these are authors that are have already kind of established themselves in their their native language um but there is a push at kind of that higher level of authors that are doing six and seven figures to start looking at how they can move their books into translation. And certainly, um, you know, what I've seen is that's one of, the, one of the avenues where some indie authors tend to go back into traditional, right? They see that as okay, it's a way, but there's, I would say equal amount or maybe more that are like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure this out and get the resources myself. To, yeah, definitely. I think it makes sense. I mean, bo both avenues make sense. I think um, selling your your foreign rights to publishers makes sense for countries that are really small uh, and where you probably wouldn't be able to recoup your investment in the translation. Mm -hmm. uh, or countries where it's really, really hard to publish on your own and sell books like China, for example. There mm -hmm. it makes sense. For the European countries, um, France, Italy, uh, Spain, Germany, Germany being by far the number one. It makes sense to go on your own uh, because those markets are really becoming a lot, a lot more digital, especially in these times. Like ebook growth has been crazy in France, Italy, and Spain, three countries that have been like digital resistant from the start. Like ebook penetration has <laughs> been pretty slow in those countries and now it's booming uh, because of COVID. So, um, so yeah, now's the right time. Germany is already there. I think Mark Dawson is making a killing in Germany. I don't know if Germany's actually making more money right now than the UK. It's possible. Mm. Um, and one of the big changes recently that justify why you, you should go uh, into those countries on your own is that Amazon opened up Amazon ads for all these marketplaces. So, and, and to run Amazon ads, you just, you don't need to know the language. You just have to copy paste author names and book titles. Yeah. Uh, for targeting so you don't really need to to have any knowledge of that language to be able to market in those in those territories and, and to sell books mm. so now it's really the right time to go into translation in my opinion yeah and I, i've what i've observed is you know when you look at some of the genres where indies have been really um aggressive and growing and traditional publishers just seem to not be paying attention. Um, the markets, you know, they've kind of fulfilled the need in this market, in the US market. And it's like, well, yeah, there's no lit RPG or there's no military science fiction in Germany. You know, I've got the books written. Why not? It's not like there isn't a market for it there. It's just there hasn't been um, good products put in, in place. And I think that, you know, authors, who are really thinking about they're essentially, you know, building this brand globally that they want to, they want to do that. One, one question I have for you on that is, so um, I, I, I would kind of think there's kind of two pieces I would need from Reedsy. So I need, I need a translator to translate the book, but then wouldn't I also need an editor of some type that, 
kind of can bridge the gap for me because like, if I'm going to put my book into German, I don't speak German. So how, how, how would you address something like that? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so generally freelancers, like freelance professionals on Realty, we ask them that they, they only work on the, on the books themselves, like that they don't outsource anything to anyone else. And translation is an exception to that. Uh, we actually ask our translators that they work with, in tandem in pair with another translator so that one does a translation and the other one edits it. Oh, okay. So it's a combined, it. great, great. It's a combined, so, exactly. Okay. So, so in that case, are, when you're looking at that, while it might be seem really expensive, you're really kind of getting two services bundled. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is to deliver a manuscript that's publishing ready in that country. And then, I mean, the only thing you have to figure out is the, yeah, the, the Amazon advertising language in that country. But I mean, the interface just looks the same. So, so you're going to be able to, to, to manage it. Um, you can ask your translator to create you, to translate your bio, obviously. So you can uh, fill in your, your author central page in that country. And yeah, any things that you need that just require translation, you've got a translator there for uh, the mm -hmm. blurb, keywords, all that. So it's, they do more than just translating the book. Uh, they work with someone else to edit it and then they can help you with, uh, with the marketing as well. Uh, that's that's really interesting. So I'm sure a lot of folks are thinking, well, I can get a lot of these services other places. You know, Fiverr is a place where I hear people a lot of times going to. You want to kind of talk to those points about why Readsy makes more sense than, you know, getting your mother-in-law to do it or hiring a guy in Fiverr for 10 bucks. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the first point, obviously, is quality. Uh, we spend a lot of time and a lot of human resources on checking every ind individual profile. Um, and we do background checks, actually, on all the on all those profiles. So if someone says they work at Penguin for five years, we actually double check that. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into the vetting. And... That means that we're confident enough to add an extra layer of security. So we offer a project protection service where if anything goes wrong with your collaboration, like if you feel you haven't really received uh, the quality that you were expecting or that you paid for or the freelancer is late or the freelancer hasn't met the brief, then you can come to us and we investigate the collaboration, we mediate and we force refunds if refunds need to be processed. Um, so it's basically, we're not, REITs is not part of their collaboration. We try to not interfere at all. Uh, we don't want to be part of these collaborations, but we're there if you need us, if anything goes wrong. So there's mm. that additional layer of security that you won't find on a lot of other, on a lot of other places on top of the, of the quality um, of our vetting. Mm -hmm. So those, those are the two main things, but by all means, if you've got your own, editor, your own designer that you have a great relationship with and that are doing great, then you really don't need Reedsy for, for these services. It's, mm -hmm. We've built an a, la carte, an a la carte marketplace, so you can use us for whatever you need at whatever point. Um, we talked a lot about the, the human capital that you've got there in the marketplace, but I know you got a bunch of other tools. I remember you showing me at Nink, your editor, and I was like, wow, that's that's a hidden gem. You want to talk about some of the other uh, tools that you have that are either free or paid or however they work. Yeah, for sure. So most other tools we're going to, we're going to have are free. Um, so the, the most useful one I'd say is, uh, is the one you mentioned, the Ritzy book editor. And that's, that started out as a, as a free formatting tool. Uh, and it's now kind of a writing tool as well. So the way it works is, a very clean writing interface um, with chapters and parts on the left uh, designed for writing books. So you can write in there or you can just import your Word document and we're all automatically going to process it. And then when, when you're ready, um, when the manuscript is ready to be published, you, just, you can just export it to a print-ready PDF or um, to an EPUB and movie. 
through the Ritzy book editor. So it's somewhat similar to Vellum with um, a lot less customization possibilities. Like we only have two template, three templates available and you can put like fancy things in the corners of your pages or like fancy chapter headings and things and things like that, which a lot of authors really love. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if readers care about them that much, but <laughs> authors definitely. So we don't have that. Uh, so if you really want that, you should invest in Vellum. But otherwise, um, give our Ritzy book editor a try because the advantage it has is that it's 100% free and it's browser-based. So you don't need to download an app or anything. You can access it from anywhere in the world uh, through any browser. So it's definitely worth taking a look at. And I think it's something we don't talk about enough probably when we communicate about Ritzy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, most folks are very focused on getting that uh, those resources, right? And, and they want yeah. your, your help to think through that investment because, I mean, just for um, reference point, what would you say kind of the range is for hiring a developmental editor? Yeah, so we have those, um, we have those in a blog post uh, so if you Google cost of self-publishing, you should find that blog post pretty quickly. Um, but we have a blog post and a calculator where every year we, we pull out the averages, the average costs for, uh, for all types of editing by genre. Cause they vary quite a bit by genre. Oh, okay. That's, uh, yeah. Developmental editing for nonfiction, for example, is more expensive, uh, for some reason than nonfiction. Uh, it's cheaper in romance. It's more expensive in historical fiction because there's more research involved. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of interesting things there. On average, I think you should budget between $1,500 and maybe $2,500 for a developmental edit for a full full length novel. Mm -hmm. um, again, it also depends a lot on how messy the novel is. If it's your first one, probably on the higher, uh, on the higher ends of that yeah. range. If it's the third time you work with the same developmental editor and your style's gotten a lot better and there are a lot less uh, mistakes in there, then the, the developmental editor is probably going to quote you a lot less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know for a lot of um, authors that those are some scary numbers, right? Yeah. Um, now, you know, he here's, here's the thing, you know, this is the business of writing. So putting stuff in context, you can, pu you can publish a book for free, right? Like you can, you can write it. You don't have to go get it edited or you could have your mom do the editing. You can make your own cover. You can put the book on for free. But if your expectation is for a reader to give you money for that book, then the quality of that product is going to dictate how much money you can potentially get, right? So there has to be that investment. So to, you know, you don't, you don't have to spend that kind of money, but if you're really thinking that this is going to be a lifelong career, then you're going to be building up product that people are going to buy over decades, then, you know, that's a small investment. And, and it could be a crucial investment because you could spend, you know, you have a great cover that people are like, I have to read that book. And then they open it up and they don't make it, past the look inside, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the, um, that unfortunately happens quite, quite a bit. Um, and yeah, as I said, uh, I think Mark Coker from Smashwords once said, I mean, I don't usually endorse all the things he says, especially <laughs> regarding Amazon. <laughs> But in the early days of self-publishing, he said, if you have like $1,000 to invest in marketing your book, uh, put them into editing. Mm -hmm. And I think that holds true still today. Um, if you have any money to invest in your book, it, had, it first has to go to editing. Because, I mean, a great cover is great, but it's only going to help you sell the first copy. And then word of mouth is never going to happen because the people who are going to read your book uh, are not going to enjoy it. Or as you say, they don't even buy it because they don't make it past the look inside. Um, so first money has to go to editing and then, then it has to go to cover design and then everything else is kind of bonus. Mm -hmm. Um, but these two things are necessary in the, in 99% of the cases. Um, so yeah. 
Well, I, I find it super ironic that authors are prepared to spend a thousand bucks on an advertising course and then go throw hundreds and hundreds of dollars into advertising on Amazon, but cringe at spending a thousand bucks on an editor, right? Like, so you're, you're investing your, your, your capital in pushing out a subpar product and then you wonder why it dies off. Yeah, there's, for some people it hurts more to think that the problem lies in the product rather than on the marketing, you know? Um, I've heard from countless authors saying, I just, I just can't market this book or like the, it's just impossible to sell books on Amazon anymore or things like that. And then 99, 99% of the time when I look into it, there's a pro either a problem with the cover, the blurb, the, the look inside or something like that. So product has always, ha always has to come first. Uh, the landscape's definitely competitive product on its own is not enough anymore. If you publish the most amazing book, there are chances that no one will read it and that it's going to get buried. Those chances mm -hmm. are there. So advertising is probably almost necessary nowadays or some form of marketing is necessary. But as something that I always say is that any money you pour into advertising or marketing um, when the book isn't ready and the cover isn't ready is just money lost. Like mm -hmm. you could throw it out of the window. No, I, I agree. I, I, you know, I, I know from work that I've done with clients that when we spend the money on great covers, that not only you, you actually can, you can see a return because your cost in advertising goes down. Right? That's right. And, and so, and, I, and I'm knowing this is from authors that are, um, that are doing well and they go back and say, reskin an old, old book. Right. And um, that process, then they, they realize that, you know, their advertising costs have gone down with that investment. And I also know that um, there are authors that have um, done really well in, 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 in writing genres when, you know, you and I would read the books and we're like, well, this isn't particularly well written. Like, but because they've, they understand their audience and what their audience expects, right? They, they really thought about it from a, a product standpoint. They know that they can write this way. For example, like you can get away with certain things, say in romance, just general romance that you couldn't get away in historical romance. Right. Absolutely. Right. Or if you're writing um, historical fiction of any kind, right. You have a level of, uh, readership that just like they're into history. So guess what? They may know more about this stuff than you. So you got to get your stuff right. So you understanding where you're placing that product um, is, is so important. And that's something also the editor is going to have context for, right? They're going to be able to say, Hey, you know, I've read a lot of books in this genre and you're missing out on, you know, these kind of things that people expect, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Another example is military sci-fi. I know that readers are very, very picky about the military aspects, you know, not so much about the sci-fi, but the military aspects have to be really, really nailed. Um, so you gotta, you gotta either really know, have, ideally you should have read a lot of books in the genre that you're writing so that it comes instinctively to you. But in case mm -hmm. you miss anything, hire, hire an editor specializing in that genre with that genre knowledge. Um, to do the editing and same goes for design like i'm i'm doing um kind of an analysis of of best-selling books covers across categories on amazon and you see you clearly see some very very strong genre expectations like something like 70 percent of books in the space opera category you have a spaceship on the cover um 80 i think 85 percent of books in urban fantasy have a character on the cover and 50% have a character with like glowing hands or some magic yeah, yeah. on the cover. So if you're familiar with those genres, you'll know this already, but if it's the first time and you're thinking of putting, I don't know, like a magical creature on the cover for your urban fantasy, think again, you know, or hire a cover designer who specializes in urban fantasy and will be able to tell, you know, actually you need your, your, your magic teenager with like glowing hands. Yeah. And a leather jacket. 
with a leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, well, and there's so much to that. Um, some of the stuff that we're looking at, it's, it's, it's really core psychological principles about fluency. Like if, if you're used to thinking about a thing a certain way and you, and and you're fluent in seeing, okay, I know urban fantasy has the girl with the magic in her hand. And I, you, and you're thinking about it from the sales perspective on Amazon, that that's a one by one inch picture is the first chance you have to grab somebody either when it's displayed on a search or in an ad, like there has to, it's, it's very just a figure of like, the, okay, now I want to look deeper, right? That could be all that it, the difference in, people even looking at your book ever on something like Amazon. And like you said, cover designers understand that. Like they're not just thinking about like, I'm going to draw you this really badass cover. It's like, I have to have a silhouette on that cover that when it shrunk down is still eye catching. Right. I have to have the, the, the fonts a certain way so that people understand that this is the paranormal romance font. Right. Like, That's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, but to, to, you mentioned it earlier, the market's so much more sophisticated. This is the kind of stuff that authors are talking about. This is the stuff that they're figuring out and understanding and why they're beating traditional publishers in a lot of spaces. Right. Yeah. Cause traditional publishers don't have, don't necessarily have the bandwidth to do that research. Um, they publish generally across several different genres. So they don't have the time to go deep into what does a paranormal romance shifter cover looks like? What does it have to look like, you know? Uh, so either they, they're lucky and they hire a designer specializing in that, or if they hire their generic or their historical romance cover designer, then the cover's not really gonna um, appeal to that audience as much. Mm. So yeah, indies have a huge opportunity, especially if they, especially if they focus on one genre, that's one thing. <laughs> That, that a lot of authors uh, struggle with, but I think it really pays off in the end. If you manage to focus on one genre or at least one category, one big category uh, on Amazon, it's gonna work a lot better down the road for you, not just because you're gonna develop a knowledge of marketing in that genre, but also because you're gonna have better read through across your different books, series, universes, and all that. If you ask, uh, an urban fantasy reader to follow you to your new cupcake cozy mystery you've written. <laughs> it's probably going to be tough, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, so Ricardo, um, is there anything else you think, uh, you know, you'd want to cover, you know, any top secret stuff you want to let out of the bag now or anything we may have missed just, no, just uh, maybe just last word on our on our free courses because uh, yeah, yeah. now is definitely a time when a lot of people have time for free courses. Um, so we've got over fifty over fifty free courses on a bunch of aspects. Um, if you're a beginner writer, courses on like character development, structure, plot. Even if you've been writing a lot of books, but you want to learn more about kind of the um, the theories behind the three act story structure. We've got a course on that, for example. And then we've got a bunch of courses for more advanced writers on, on marketing. So we've got a pretty cool course, uh, which I wrote. So that's why it's pretty cool <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> on building a mailing list. Uh, so if you don't have a mailing list yet, that's a perfect place to start. We've got a great course by David Gogren on Boba Bats because he's the expert on Boba Bats. Uh, and we also have courses on Amazon ads, Amazon algorithms, Facebook ads. So if you, if one of your goals during lockdown is to get better at marketing your books, um, this is a great place where you can look for free courses called read, C, read, C learning. Um, and yeah, worth mentioning. Awesome. And where can folks find, they won't be finding you at conferences right now, but where can they find more information about you and read Z and the work you guys are doing. Yeah, Read C. Um, so our landing page is readc.com, R E E D S Y.com. Uh, so that's where you're going to find kind of the hub that's going to point you to all the other resources. And me, me, you can find me pretty much everywhere Twitter, Facebook, if you search for Ricardo Fayette. 
uh, you're probably going to find me. Um, and otherwise, my email address is ricardo at readc.com. So pretty simple. Uh, and feel free to reach out to me with any questions. I'm always happy to, to answer all three questions by email. Well, it's been great to have you on. And fingers crossed, um, we will see each other face to face at Nink. Hopefully. Yeah. It's looking bad, but hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not I, in, in Vegas. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that that's that probably is a better chance. Yeah, that's but, a better chance. Um, yeah, so we'll see. I'm um I'm really hoping to be at both of those, but like we were talking earlier before we got on, who knows what travel restrictions will still be in place. Yeah. I'll I'll settle for, for seeing you in person at some point this year. There you go. Yeah, it's something in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for coming on and sharing everything about Readsy and how to build a uh, team for uh, supporting your publishing. Thanks for having me, Joe. All right. Bye.